Unfortunately, as in the air, our inadequate numbers had to yield to an enemy multitude fighting on two fronts. We were obliged, in effect, to defend a fortress with a circumference of 2,000 miles. To cite a single example, the fighting on the Vistula north of Krakow pitted 28,000 Germans supported by 36 Tiger tanks and 20 Panthers against two strong Soviet armies of 600,000 men and seven armored regiments disposing of 1,100 tanks of various kinds. Toward noon the next day, we arrived at a small village about 15 miles northeast of Kharkov. The place was filled with smoke, and to judge by the noise, fighting was still going on quite nearby. The Steiner of the officer who had picked us up at the Kolkholz drew ahead while the rest of us jumped down from our machines. Flickering light a mile or so to the south marked the line of fire. The soldiers who had come with me peed into a hedge or chewed some food with blank faces. I myself have never been able to achieve a resigned, indifferent attitude in the face of pressing danger. Nevertheless, I tried to hide my desperate anxiety. Perhaps the others were doing the same thing. The Steiner came back, and two noncoms wrote down our names. Then we were organized into groups of fifteen, led either by a sergeant or an Obergefreiter. The officer climbed onto the seat of the Steiner and spoke to us briefly, mincing no words. The enemy has cut us off from our line of retreat. To get around them, we would have to turn north onto the plain, where there are no roads. This could be fatal. Therefore, we will have to break through their barrage to reach our new positions, which are quite close. As further elements of the Dawn Army arrive, they will be used to maintain the passage already open, which will allow all our soldiers to escape the Bolshevik noose. Thereafter, you will proceed to positions which will be announced and which you will maintain until further orders. I was about to say that I belonged to the transport service when I suddenly felt ashamed. Munitions boxes were opened and their contents distributed. My pockets and cartridge pouches were full, and I was given two defensive grenades which I didn't know how to operate. We moved single file to the edge of the village past houses burning from enemy incendiaries. Groups of men were walking about in the debris, Others were tending to the wounded. Some burnt-out German vehicles were still smoking. We were taken over by a lieutenant who asked five or six of us to follow him down a long street which was still more or less intact. A salvo whistled past us, and we threw ourselves to the ground. It fell somewhere in the center of the village, about seven or eight hundred yards behind us. Enemy shells had dug several holes in the packed earth which lay between the two rows of buildings and occasional mutilated bodies lay sprawled out on the streets. We walked for about 15 minutes, sticking close to the buildings, until we heard the sound of automatic weapons. About a hundred yards ahead of us, the street was swept by mortar fire. We hesitated for a moment. Then we saw some running figures emerging from the wall of dust stirred up by the enemy salvo. Auf whom? shouted the lieutenant. Instantly, we dropped to our knees, or even onto our stomachs, ready to open fire, but stood up again when we saw German uniforms. The other soldiers ran over to us and threw themselves down by our sides. We could see that still more were coming through the flying dust. Several of them were howling at the tops of their lungs, a sound which combined fear, anger, and pain. I watched the soldier without a gun who was trying to run, holding his right thigh with both hands. He fell, stood up, and fell again. Two others were staggering slowly after him. I heard someone shout, Ah, boi, and was trying to see which of them had used my language, when a fresh salvo struck the group, scattering about ten of them in search of shelter. Two of the men continued toward us, despite the danger. They ran to a door, which they were able to kick in without much trouble, and stood in its opening, shouting curses in French. Amazed, and without a thought of danger, I ran across the street, bursting in on them like a whirlwind. They paid no attention to me. Hey, I said, shaking one of them by his straps, are you French? 
They turned toward me and looked at me for a fraction of a second. Then their eyes returned to a cloud of dust and smoke pouring from a house which had just burst into flames. No, the Walloon Division, one of them said, without looking back a second time. A series of explosions made us blink and hunch our shoulders. They shoot us just like rabbits. They never take prisoners. I'm French, I said with an uncertain smile. Well then, look out. Volunteers are never prisoners. But I'm not a volunteer. The street was raked by a new salvo of mortar fire, somewhat closer than before. Twenty yards away, a roof disintegrated, and the retreat whistle broke off our conversation. We ran as hard as we could, back the way we had just come, followed by a burst of machine gun fire. Two or three men spun around and doubled up, screaming with pain. We almost ran over two men with a heavy machine gun, which they hadn't been able to fire because we had been in the way. Several groups of men had reached a street at right angles to ours, and it scattered among the ruins. The lieutenant was blowing his whistle again to regroup us. When two Mark III suddenly came into sight, they rolled up to the lieutenant, who stood in the middle of the street waving them forward. After a brief consultation, they moved obliquely into the street we had just left, advancing toward the Bolsheviks. The lieutenant tried to reorganize us again, and we set off in the wake of the tanks. I jumped from the corners of buildings to piles of rubble at a state of terror, unable to grasp why I was there or to distinguish anything to fire at. For seconds at a time, our tanks would disappear from view in the turmoil of dust and smoke and flames, but they always re-emerged with their guns firing. Soon we had run past the point where our retreat had begun and into an open space surrounded by wooden peasant houses grouped around a pond. The tanks were driving around the pond, crushing every obstacle. On the far side of the pond we could easily see men running in several directions. We stood on the bank and opened a concentrated fire. Another German company arrived on our right and threw grenades at a house in which some of the enemy had taken shelter. Our tanks were now on the other side of the pond and were flattening the position just taken from the enemy. At last I had the opportunity to fire at some Russians. They were no more than thirty yards away, riding from the house our soldiers had attacked with grenades. At least ten Mausers fired, and not one of the Russians stood up again. The fact that we were advancing, and that we felt ourselves suddenly in control of the situation, stimulated us in spite of everything. We had just dislodged an enemy numerically stronger than we, as was always the case in Russia, and we felt as if we had been given wings. The sound of firing and the groans of the wounded incited us to massacre the Russians, who had inflicted us with so many horrifying wounds. An attacking army is always more enthusiastic than an army on the defensive and more likely to accomplish prodigies. This was particularly true of the German army, which was organized to attack, and whose defense consisted of slowing the enemy by counterattack. A few of our men took over a Russian cannon and immediately put it into action. A rapid liaison was established between our two tanks and this newly improvised artillery, which poured all the shells just captured from the Russians onto precisely selected targets. Then the tanks turned back, leaving the defense of the area to us. Directed by the lieutenant, we placed ourselves as best we could in readiness for any new surprises. We could hear the sound of continuous firing all around us. A fine rain began to fall. At dusk we were still exchanging fire with the enemy, who had grown bolder, and were trying to come back. With darkness, our terror returned and the firing almost stopped. The lieutenant sent someone to fetch some flares. To the southwest, the horizon lit up in time with sporadic heavy artillery fire. Without knowing it, we had become part of the Third Battle of Kharkov, whose front extended for some 200 miles around the city. With darkness and rain, the fighting for our group was almost over. Behind us, we could still hear the sound of automatics, which penetrated the noise of engines. Our vehicles were using the darkness to try to get through the Russian barrage. 
We thought that at any moment we might see the Popovs running towards us through the night. A Volkswagen came up from behind with all its lights out. The driver spoke for a moment with the leader of our group and then handed some flat mines to four of our men. With white faces, they went off into the darkness to place the mines on either side of the pond. Five minutes later, we heard a rough cry from the left, and a short time after that, two of the four came back from the right. After another half hour, we concluded that the two had gone to the left and had run into a Russian knife. Much later that night, when we were all feeling overwhelmed by sleep, we witnessed a tragedy that froze my blood. We had just thrown about a dozen grenades at random to forestall some suspected danger when a prolonged and penetrating cry arose from the hole on my left. It lasted for several minutes, as if it were coming from the throat of someone who was fighting desperately. Then there was a cry for help, which brought us all from our holes and shelters. About ten of us ran toward the sound. The darkness was torn by the white lights of several shots. Fortunately, no one was hit. We arrived at the edge of the foxhole where a Russian, who had just thrown down his revolver, was holding his hands in the air. At the bottom of the hole, two men were fighting. One of them, a Russian, was waving a large cutlass, holding a man from our group, pinned beneath him. Two of us covered the Russian who had just raised his hands, while a young Obergefreiter jumped into the hole and struck the other Russian a blow on the back of his neck with a trenching tool. The Russian let go at once, and the German, who had been under him, who had just missed having his throat cut, ran up to ground level. He was covered with blood, brandishing the Russian knife with one hand like a madman, while with the other he tried to stop the flow of blood pouring from his wound. Where is he? he shouted in a fury. Where's the other one? In a few bounding steps, he reached the two men and their prisoner. Before anyone could do anything, he had run his knife into the belly of the petrified Russian. Cutthroat, he yelled, looking with wild eyes for another belly to open. We had to hold him so he wouldn't run past our lines. The lunatic, who was losing a lot of blood, was dragged to the rear by two of our men. The intermittent rain began to soak into our clothes and weigh them down. The pond gave off a faint smell. Two men began to snore. Throughout the night, which seemed interminable, I kept up dull conversation with my companions to prevent a nervous collapse. In the distance, we could hear the continuous rumble of our retreating trucks. Enemy action began well before dawn. Flares above our position blinded us with their unexpected white lights. We looked at each other in wordless confusion. The intensity of this diabolical light threw a sinister, almost indecent glare on our ghostly faces. At daybreak, enemy artillery poured a hail of projectiles of every caliber onto the road about a quarter of a mile behind us. Beyond my hole, when I dared look outside, I could see other helmets poking up here and there from below the ground. Under their visors, eyes gleaming with fatigue, were trying to discern our immediate future on the dim bank across the pond. I scraped up some crumbs of vitamin biscuit, which was the last food in my possession. Insomnia and exhaustion made us incapable of grasping the situation with any precision. We were simply there, shivering and wet, and if even a small group of Russians had appeared, we wouldn't have been able to stop them. Fortunately, the Soviets didn't attack, and we were only subjected to one round of mortar fire, which, nevertheless, wounded nine of us. At last the sun rose, and we felt somewhat better. We had not been given any more food, but then a soldier of the Reich was supposed to be able to withstand cold, heat, rain, suffering, hunger, and fear. Our stomachs growled, and the blood beat in our temples, and at our smallest joints. But the air and the earth and the universe were growling too. From habit, we were almost able to persuade ourselves that this was a possible way to live. I know of many who actually managed it. We covered another twelve miles on foot, 
constantly threatened by Soviet patrols who would open fire without hesitation on even a single famished Lanzer. After diving down some 30 times or more to avoid Russian salvos, we arrived at a Luftwaffe airfield, which had already been abandoned. We thought that the wooden buildings, which were like the ones we had occupied on the Don, might still contain some scraps of food. Carrying our four wounded men on improvised stretchers, we walked toward one of the huts, stumbling with exhaustion, but we never reached it. A scene of intense horror stopped six or seven of us. We had just passed a bunker in which we noticed a body lying at the bottom. Two emaciated cats were eating one of its hands. I felt sick. Get out, you cats, shouted my companion. Everyone came over to look. The lieutenant, as sickened as I had been, threw a grenade. The two ghostly cats ran off into the countryside, while the explosion sent a column of more or less human debris straight up into the air like a chimney. If the cats are eating stiffs, somebody said, there couldn't be much left in the pantry. There were still two bite motors with Maltese crosses on their wings standing on the empty field, probably inoperable in some way. From the sky we heard a disquieting sound, which was growing louder. We all turned our white faces the same way, suddenly realizing that we were standing beside two planes in the center of a vast, flat space and could hardly fail to attract attention. We scattered without waiting for any orders, flinging ourselves onto the ground, trying to escape those six black dots, which were already falling toward us like lightning. I thought immediately of the bunker where the cats had been feasting. Six others had the same idea and although I ran as fast as I could, I arrived next to last, beside the hole where four soldiers were already trampling on what was left of a human being. I looked desperately into that crowded space, hoping that some miracle would make it larger. Two others were doing the same thing. Maybe we'd make a mistake. Maybe the planes were really ours. But that was impossible. The sound was unmistakable. The noise grew louder and louder. We threw ourselves down, painfully aware of our absolute exposure. I held my head between my hands and closed my eyes, trying to obliterate the muffled explosions which reached my partially blocked ears. I felt the fury of hell pass over me like a hurricane. The blow striking the earth shook every organ in my body, and I knew that I was going to die. Then the storm passed as quickly as it had come. I lifted my head to see the enemy formation break apart as it climbed higher into the pale blue sky. Here and there across the field, men were getting up and running for better cover. The Russian planes had regrouped and were turning as tightly as they could. Then they swooped down at us again. I began to run like a madman, with my legs flying, trying to force myself to go faster. But I knew that exhaustion had the upper hand, that I would never reach the road with its ditch, which might shelter me. I kept stumbling over my heavy boots. In desperation, and despite myself, I fell onto the wet grass, instinctively aware that the planes were on top of us again. The first explosion shook the ground, filling me with a frantic fear. I scratched at the ground like a rabbit whose last hope of escape is to bury itself. I could hear the earth being torn and horrifying human shrieks. White flashes burned into my eyes through my clenched fist and eyelids. I lay there for two or three minutes, which seemed like an eternity. When I finally looked up, the two bimotors were burning like torches. The Russian planes were far off turning back into formation for another attack. They pulled up after this one in all directions. Once again, I called on all my reserves of strength to get up and run, the other way this time, to the wooden buildings, which suddenly seemed to offer refuge. I had covered about a third of the distance when the Russian planes attacked, shooting rockets into the buildings, which disintegrated like matchwood. After a few moments of further terror, we could hear the engines of the planes fading into the distance.
No one spoke. We stared at the flames, at the sky, at the reddening heaps of human remains. Our lieutenant, who seemed to have lost his sanity, although he was unhurt, was running from one wounded man to another. Someone shouted, Another attack like that, and there won't be anyone left. They've just left us here. We'll never get out. Shut up, shouted the lieutenant, who was supporting a wounded man. War is never a picnic. Who did he think he was telling? We gathered round him. We lifted the shoulders of a poor fellow covered with mud and blood, who was laughing to split his sides. For a moment I thought he was crying with pain, but he was in fact howling with laughter. That's the philosopher, someone said. I'd never noticed the man before. His friend added that he had always believed he would return home unscathed. Three of us tried to lift him to his feet, but soon realized this was impossible. His bursts of laughter were interrupted by words which I understood perfectly and thought about for a long time afterwards and which still troubled me. As I remember his laugh, there was nothing mad about it. It was more like the laugh of someone who had been the victim of a practical joke, a farce in which he had believed until suddenly he realized his folly. No one questioned the philosopher, but he himself, through his hilarity and his agony, tried to explain, Now I know why. I know why. It's too simple. It's idiotic. Perhaps we would have learned what he meant but a sudden surge of blood poured from his mouth and ended his life. We dug graves for the new victims and then stretched out, exhausted, on the bed of warm ashes that mark the site of the destroyed buildings.